Amen. Let the church say amen. Is the church in here today? Can I hear the church say amen? It's a personal relationship we got to have with God. You got to feel that. I can't make you feel that, but I can tell you, I feel it and it feels good. Whoa!
today. This is the right tempo. I'd like, uh, well, Pastor Lyle is here already, so uh, we're going to go into our communion moments. Uh, welcome uh, the pastor, welcome him back. I was in here last week, so I, I didn't get to see the video presentation, but I'm glad to see him here in flesh and face, and let's give him, let's show him how much you missed him. Amen. Amen. It's good to be back, Grace. Uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you all. Thank you for the privilege. I had to be off with my wife and family so that uh, she and the children and myself could celebrate for the first time in 20 years an opportunity to be with her family for Christmas. We thank you for that occasion. Uh, this is not about me, though. It's about the Lord. And these moments are precious moments. They are the high point of church services throughout the known world. A time when Jesus Christ is lifted up for his great work that was accomplished on our behalf. You know, the scriptures that we read at the beginning really help us with an appreciation for how powerful these moments are. It says, and you can read along in your bulletin, you see, from Romans 5, 6 through 8, you see, at just the right time, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will someone die for a righteous man. We know that to be true, though it happens. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, still in our sins, Christ died for us. One of those powerful passages that I believe every believer ought to have committed to mind. It just says it all. I mean, you could work a message. You don't have to be a pastor. But boy, you can work a message from that passage. You know, when people come to the scriptures and they look at the scriptures, they often come away with an image that God is an angry God. He hates sin as he wants to destroy them. Well, the fact of the matter is God hates sin and cannot have sin in his presence. But God loves sinners and wants to see them delivered out of their, their sins. And we've been singing that. We've been singing that with great gusto. Once like a bird in prison I dwelt. No freedom from my sorrow I felt. But Jesus came and listened to me and glory to God. He set me free. He set me free. So here it was throughout the scriptures. We see that God is a God who hates sin. He is holy and cannot have sin in his presence. But God loves the sinner. And if that is a concept too hard for us to grasp, God said, let me show them. Let me demonstrate it to them. Oh, he'd sent prophets who would tell the people about God's love for them. He, he sent uh, his word that people would know, but still it was hard for them to grasp that concept. And so we come to this powerful scripture. At just the right time, when we were still powerless, we hadn't found a way to become righteous. No. At that time, Christ died for the ungodly. What's the cross all about? It's Christ dying for the ungodly. It's not that the Romans and the Jews have plotted together to destroy an instigator. No, no, no. That, that's just the stuff around it. What the real story of the crucifixion is, is this. Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. The rest is just fluff around that main point. Christ died for the ungodly. And... It is the absolute greatest demonstration of God's love for us. Brothers and sisters, I've always loved how Christmas and New Year's are within a week of each other. Because in the midst of all that gift giving, we recognize that God has given a great gift. And as we start a new year, we can realize that we can have the old things passed away and look forward to new things happening because we are in an ongoing, thriving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and I. And we have gained access to that righteousness by faith. Let us go on to live for the praise of his glory. For Christ died for us. 
that we might live to the praise of his glory. It's the start of a new year. Friends, shed your regrets, as I said in the video uh, last week. Shed yourself of grudges, regrets, broken relationships. Start fresh, start new. Let, let, let this breaking of the old and into the new be an excellent jumping start off point for you to just reboot, start again. Give it all to the glory of God. Let nothing stop you from giving God your all. Jesus Christ, we know in the Garden of Gethsemane, it's quite clear, he did not want to have to know that he would be separated from his father. The trial that was to come was almost more than he could bear. The stress and strain on him, he bled blood. But the Bible says, when he considered the joy set before him, that he would redeem a lost humanity back to God, and enjoy us as his own possession, he set his face like a flint, and he went to the cross, and he could say there, dying on that cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Brothers and sisters, can we forgive each other and say, Father, I choose to forgive. They don't know the damage they've done, the pain they've caused, but I choose to forgive. to the glory of God. For this bread that we eat represents his body broken for us. And this cup that we drink, it represents his blood shed for us. There's now no more remission for sins. Let us not take up sinning, but let us take up righteousness and live to the praise of his glory. As is our custom, I will break the bread and the Pass out the cup and the ushers will bring them to you. If you are a believer in a right relationship with God, this is a moment that we share in together, the feast of the believers. If you are not in a right relationship with God right now, take a moment to repent, get your life right with God if you are a believer so that you may eat. If you are not a believer, these moments are not for you. They are for those who are trusting by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But I pray that by the end of our service today, if you're not right with Christ, the way would be made plain to you. You would trust Christ and Him alone as Lord and Savior. Amen. Jesus loves me. Oh. 
theological statement. I don't know why Jesus loved me, but I'm so glad he did. Thank God he did, indeed. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Shall we eat together? Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, held it before them and said, this cup represents a new covenant in my blood. 
Take, drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat and drink of it, you proclaim my death until I come. This is a proclamation of our faith. Christ died for the ungodly, that we might be saved and enjoy a relationship with God. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. Amen. 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 At this time in the service, we'll have our scripture verse to remember. I'm going to ask Adam Trico to come up to encourage us, to guide us, and to lead us in our scripture verse to remember today. Morning, church. Morning, sir. I had a dream. I tripped on the stairs. I got up carefully, that's why. It is week three, which means y'all have this memorized. Amen. Amen. That's terrible. Who knows this verse? Y'all getting more or worse off. All right, this is the scariest verse in the Bible, so maybe that's why y'all aren't learning it. Why is it scary? It's the last line. That's a little hint. Man, y'all ain't following me. Why is the last line scary? Because if you ain't doing nothing, it ain't because you ain't got no job. It's because you ain't doing your job. Everybody get why it's scary now? Okay, y'all ain't following me yet. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Y'all can get it when we read it. For it is by grace we are saved. Through faith, not known of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by voice, so that one can move. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God has prepared in mind. God is scrapping around trying to find something for y'all to do? No. He's trying to find something for us to do? No. He prepared it when? Yeah. All right. Now it's scary, right? Now it's scary, right? Yeah. So who ain't doing nothing in church? <laughs> everybody's active. All right, we got some good Christians in here. I'm noticing everybody's looking up here as if God himself is looking at you. Next week, everyone will just be closing their eyes and saying it. Amen? 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 Amen. Let's see if peer pressure works. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace is the grace of God, not of yourself. Let's start over, man. That was terrible. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace, through faith, that's as Robinson tells. It is a gift from God, not of works, so that no man knows. God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, through good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. All right, church, next week, one reciting with it up and one with it gone. Yes. Amen. 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 Let's encourage him. Even though some of them will disappoint you, Adam, they will encourage you. And I believe the reason why a lot of people ain't scared is because we're doing our work, right? Right, Grace? Amen. You only get scared if you ain't doing the work that has been prepared in advance for you to do. But those assured that they're doing God's work, they're confident. And they rest in the blood of Jesus Christ. At this time, we want to welcome our visitors. I'm going to call a few names that are on the list. And when I call your name, I'm going to ask you to please stand so that we could recognize you. I have Adonia Colbrook. Welcome, Adonia. Lynette Virgil. Welcome. Angela Palacios. Where is Angela? I don't see her. Oh, she's in the back. Welcome, Angela. The Reverend 
that's right. And I must have thought that was reversed, but yes. Reverend Angela Palacios, glad to have you. We also have Sonia Stubbs. Welcome. As you'd have noticed today, we had the, a, se a, se a section in the front roped off because we have special visitors today. Um, and I'd like to say a special welcome to the members and the staff of the legal unit of the Ministry of Finance, Cable Beach. Um, we pray that your visit with us will be enjoyable, will be an enjoyable one, and that you'll come again. Can you please all stand so we could recognize you? Mr. <laughs> Butler and our team. It's, uh, it's good to have you with us. Well, as it is a tradition at Grace, Af, pardon me? Yes, are there any other visitors? The young, young lady in the back, young ladies in the front, welcome to Grace. As it is our tradition, we have prepared a party for you after the service today, right behind me, upstairs in the welcome hall. So you cannot leave after church. Right after church, we want you to have a few drinks. Um, some. Now these are good drinks. These, these are the good drinks, some light refreshments, um, so that you can meet our leadership team and we can get to know you a little better. I'd like to ask the ushers to come forward now as we prepare to lift the offering. We're going to... We're going to put these children to be dismissed a bit later on after the special prayer. So, ushers, can you please come forward at this time? Let us all stand as we recite the Offertory Covenant. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, Luke 6 and 38. Honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your substance, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Give, and it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For well, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, all that we have belongs to you. Every single dime. But Lord, we come before you right now to offer to you an offering of tithes, an offering, a gift, a portion of what you've given to us and what all rightfully belongs to you. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to bless it for the furthering of your kingdom, and may your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. While the offering is being taken, we'll go through the news for the week. As you know, the 26th Annual Global Mission Conference is coming up on January 29th to February the 5th, 2012, with the theme, The Unfinished Task. I'd like to encourage everyone to make a note on your calendar to be present and correct for that. Next week, it's going to be a special treat, Grace. We're going to try to kick off at 10.30 because we have the Royal Bahamas Police Force Band, the second best band in the country, next to the Royal Bahamas Defense Force Band. Amen? No, no. We're going to have the band come down, and uh, they're, going to, they're going to treat us with a little mini concert. So we want to be seated by 10.30 so we can enjoy that before we actually start with the service all right pastor hannah has an announcement and after pastor hannah we'll have elder andy come up to introduce the the missions video presentation good morning good morning okay i'm up here to talk about lamplighters again next week is our lamplighters uh ceremony and you've heard about the uh police band, they're actually coming to worship with us next Sunday, and since they're coming to worship, I say, man, fellas, man, you all must be control a little concert, and they agreed, so uh, if you, you, you have to be here for 10.30 to enjoy the prelude concert that 
uh, they will do on Sunday morning. Um, uh, you want to hear them. It's, it's going to be fantastic. Now, with regard to next week, uh, we will be doing the 15th year pin celebration for lamplighters. Some of you will get your first year pin. Some of you will get your fifth year and 15 years and so on and so forth. Please, by now, you should have uh, informed Maud if you've completed your readings. Now, with regard to the readings, uh, you should be notified that the decision was made by the directors. The director could not be here this morning. He's not feeling well. But uh, the decision was made by the directors that we will introduce this year something we are calling Lamplighter's Light. Now, what Lamplighter's Light is, is, uh, um, I, I guess you could say, is, is, is some of the galleries were taken out of the, the whole reading. You need only read through the New Testament, the Proverbs, and the Psalms, and at the end of the year, you will get a Lamplighter's Light pin, recognizing your effort for having read through the New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs. Of course, regular Lamplighter's is you have to read through the entire Bible in a year. Grace, we continue to try to reach out to five registering 500 persons to read through the Bible. Remember, we will change the Bahamas one person at a time, right? Amen. When you reach out to your neighbors, your co-workers, and your family, try to get the whole family in. They may not finish, but they may read through more of the Bible than they've ever read through before in their lives. And because we have this cooperation thing, and you know you're reading as part of a whole group, there's great incentive to do so. So please, let's try to get persons registered for lamplighters. They do not have to be a member of Grace. And by the way, yesterday I performed a rededication ceremony for a couple who were visiting from Canada. Marie Major called me to do it. I did it. Uh, yes, beautiful time yesterday. And guess what? You know Marie got that couple registered to read through the Bible um, uh, this year. And their registration forms were handed in this year. That's the kind of thing we need to be doing in order to do the kind of outreach that we should be about. Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. Two weeks from today is beginning our missions conference. On behalf of all the mission board, I want to encourage you guys to keep it in prayer and um, keep praying for our, our time together and our missionaries. Um, the video we're going to watch this morning is only about two and a half minutes, all right? And it's taken from Gospel for Asia. Um, you know, we talked about that about six weeks ago. Um, I've, been, I've been going on that website. I've been so encouraged to see how God is working around the world, just to really see how he raised, he's raising up people around the world to actually give and have an impact. I'll guarantee you, if anybody, if every one of you guys in the next two weeks could go and just have a look at that site, all right, that's, that's our emphasis for this missions conference, all right, that you will see how God could use even something small, that he'll touch your heart, and you'll see the testimonies that God is working around the world. Gospel for Asia, just gfa.org, and it'll come up. There's so much testimonies, and this one is actually related to Christmas. But I chose it's only two and a half minutes, but it shows you what you can do, what God can do using us if we just give. When you see the statistics, it's just mind-boggling how much the West spends on things, how much the, the church just wastes. But if we would just use a small percentage of that, how God could use that. So listen, be in prayer, please visit the site, and um, let's allow God to prepare our hearts as we get ready for the missions conference. Thank you. Christmas, the holiday where everybody celebrates the gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the virgin birth, the manger, the wise men, Rudolph, Santa Claus, and Frosty the Snowman. Oh, what a glorious day. Wait, Christ was born in a lowly manger, not a shopping mall. Our lives are so filled with chaos that we've nearly missed the greatest gift of all time. And for what? Presents, yard decorations, tinsel, hot chocolate, Rudolph and Santa Claus? Why do we prefer plastic 
over purpose. Stuff over sacrifice. Toys over truth. Are we overlooking Christ's birth only to celebrate the meaningless each year? Do we go through the motions of the season, year after year, routinely placing our wants over the needs of others? Are we on a collision course of forgetfulness, allowing the celebration to hide Christ once again? Last year, over 460 billion was spent on Christmas, while half the world had yet to hear of Christ's name. This year, let's make a difference. If we give just 1% of 460 billion, we could build more than 400,000 churches overseas, or supply clean water to everyone in India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, or even give a Bible to every person around the world. This year, share Christ and change the world one gift at a time. I don't know about you, Grace, but when I see uh, the ads on TV to donate to various charities or various things that would do well for the world, I'm usually skeptical of where my money is going. But when I see Elder Andy and our missions team come up with solutions on how you could actually give and feel comfortable knowing that you're giving to the furthering of God's kingdom and to help change this world. I think it says a lot and it, uh, it, it shows that we can, we can do it. I'd like to, us to give Elder Andy and his team a round of applause for their efforts. <laughs> At this time, Sister Stephanie is going to come with a brief announcement before we continue with the news. Morning. Good morning. This is a new place space now. I'm advertising the United Passion Week production. Um, we had a fundraiser at the end of last year. The first fundraiser to artist us for this production was the end of last year. They are now having a second one that's supposed to be a South Out on February the 4th, Saturday, February the 4th, at Abundant Life. The tickets are only $10. Now, let me tell you all the secret about this. At the rehearsal yesterday, they, uh, all the churches uh, apparently has 100 tickets, but some little birdie told them that Grace doesn't buy tickets and they only had 50 put aside. And I boldly said, oh, that's not true. Our people are generous. So I want our quota. And so I, they gave me 100. Guys, don't shame me. When I go back next week, I want to be able to say the 100 are sold. Amen. Amen. However, 100 is not nearly enough for the amount of uh, members and, and followers that we have here. So they're also asking for some donations for making sauce. Come on, you cooks and you cake bakers and you Johnny Cake bakers and potato bread, banana bread. So I have a sign-up sheet and donations, cash donations as well. I boldly spoke up for Grace. Do not embarrass me. <laughs> Secondly, um, the rehearsals are ongoing on Saturdays at 6 to 8 at Abundant Life. Um, yesterday, I think we had about 10 Grace members. Um, that half made us proud, but, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of us around here can sing. To wit was only male. So, guys, I don't know what's happening. Let's step up to the plate. I, I, this production proves to be a wonderful production, a time for us to unite, have a united choir, a united production. So I'm looking forward to seeing more faces next week. And I'm looking for a stamp aid coming to me to buy the rest of these tickets today so I could go back probably for another 100. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Stephanie. I'm sure Grace will be well represented. We won't disappoint you. You probably could order another 100. Order another 100. I may not be here. <laughs> this week, Grace, we have quite a large birthday list. Okay? Um, on the 15th, we have the On the Turn Quest, Release Adderley. Ivan Llewellyn Armstrong, Wade Stubbs, and Stephen Burroughs Jr. These are some heavy hitters. On the 16th, we got Kim Bradford, Kirk Tinker, Gavin Culmer, 
Sherelle Johnson, Joshua and Thomas Smith. If you don't know Joshua and Thomas, you don't go to this church. On the 17th, we have Dallas Knowles, Cameron Curry, Dawn Kelly, and Andre Major Jr. On the 18th, we have the beautiful Melody Hannah. On the 19th, we have Diane Nielsen and Kim Wood Mott. On the 20th, we have Tanya Miller and Caleb P. And on the 21st, we have Atalia Lunn, Wendy Francis, Tajay Kulma, Terry Barker, Jabari Scott, Anna Wallace, and the one and only Kyla Bethel. We also have a few anniversaries. We have our dear brother Enric and sister Laverne Delavo on the 15th. And we also have on the 21st, Earl and Eva Adderley. Let's give them all a round of applause. And let's kick off the jingle. Pastor Hanno. If you get nothing else for your birthday, you got a good song. Amen. Amen. As I continue with the good news, and I say good news, as I look at special prayer, because that means you will be healed, you will be prayed for. So we have a list here for special prayer. Sister Lily Fowler, Kevin Knowles, Quaddy Lightburn, Falcon Major, Mark Cartwright, all the children at the Children's Ward North at PMH, Floyd Baxamar, Patricia Trico, Sonia LaRoda, Christine Hall, and Teddy Johnson and his family and friends. We also have a healing list. And you know, um, Grace, they say the prayer of the righteous availeth much. Not little, much. So if we all get together and pray for our brothers and sisters, we can overcome anything. Amen, Ricardo? Amen. Eric Dobble, Zonia Bain, Chalcetta Seeley, and Dawn Brian. Brian, sorry. Let's keep our brothers and sisters in prayer. We have bereaved families to pray for, Patrice Ramming, Rochelle Seeley, and others that may not be listed. Um, let's keep them in prayer, you know, like I said, um, in, in the Wednesday meeting, if you have some time, you could carry them on a pound of macaroni or something. Just be there for, let's just be there for each other. And as we come to the greatest news on this whole entire program, the expecting mothers. Now, Grace, I don't know if you're familiar with my God, but my God is known to leave remnants and on this list, we have a remnant right now. I can't really count Rockwell too much because she's not here. But the remnant that's holding the fort in the expecting mothers category is our dear Allison Sands. Now, Elder Andy told me he could try work on something for this list. But I ain't holding my breath for that one. If Sister Nancy has anything to do with it. So, the appeal is still out. This list needs to be beefed up, my dear brothers and sisters. So those married couples that have the ability to do what needs to be done, let it be done. <laughs> At this time, we're going to dismiss the kids for Sunday school. So if you have a child in K3, oh yes, that's right. And I, I switched the whole program around just for this special prayer, you know. 
At this time, I'm going to ask Pastor, Pastor Hannah to come forward, and I'm going to ask Pastor Bethel and his family to come forward, and we're going to have a special prayer for the pastoral care board, all the elders, deacons, mm -hmm. just for, okay, just for the big boss right now. The rest will be prayed for at a later time. You know, let's encourage Pastor Lyle as he comes forward. Sometimes we undervalue how important it is to have a leader of your church that leads by example. And I think I can go out on a limb and say, Pastor Lyle leads by example. Amen. Amen. Okay, would the other elders and deacons come forward at the sign, please? We'd also like to invite the Emeriti, Pastor, Pastor Rex Major in the crowd. Pastor Marcel. Marcel. Pastor Marcel. Pastor Trico. Pastor Trico. Mm -hmm. praying today for Pastor Lyle and his family because we believe that prayer works and that in the turbulent times in which we live that our only source despite our belief that governments and people and money and all of those things can make things right we as a church believe that prayer strengthens, and prayer can change things, prayer can bring about God's will in the scheme of things. And so we today put this time aside to commit our pastor and his family as the leading family of the church, commit them to God for 2012. If you wish, if you wish, you can extend your hands in, and join with us as we lift them up before the Lord. We are going to remember Pastor Lyle Bethel, Sister Janelle, his wife, um, Leah, and Logan, and Scotty, and Lauren. Lauren, I always mix you up with Leah. We're going to remember them and we are going to lift them up for covering because they're going to need it. Yes. Amen? Amen? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you because we have nowhere else to go when we need help. We are aware that we cannot find it in man, we cannot find it in government, we cannot find it in money. We cannot find it in these earthly things. And so we come to you and we bring to you this family, we bring to you Lyle Scott Bethel Sr. Father, we pray for a spiritual blessing over his life more than anything else a spiritual blessing. We pray for spiritual discernment, O oh God, in decisions that he would have to make daily with regards to how he serve you and serve others. We pray for your pouring out of wisdom on him as he is faced day to day to make decisions of leadership in the church and in the community and even at home as a family man. 
give him the wisdom that he would need. And Father, in a world that we are now finding ourselves where our time is so zapped up with everything imaginable, from traffic to information to events and all of these things that now bombard us and distract us from serving you the way we should be serving you. We ask you, Lord, to give him the capacity to deal with the volumes of things that may pass across his responsibility in any given day and time and week. Give him that capacity that he needs to deal with it as a leader, as a pastor, as a husband and a father. Father, we commit him to you. We pray that all of his obligations will be met. And that as he takes on responsibility, God, for the flock, that you would cause him to be faithful, faithful in his duties, that he would bring, O oh God, pleasure to you as a result of his work as his service, O oh God. Give him a clear mind, O oh God. Give him the peace that only you can understand, that passeth all understanding. Give him peace and give his family peace. Guide him and guide his heart. Guide his mind, O oh God. Preserve him from all of the distractions around him, O oh God. Preserve his family. Keep them safe. Keep them protected in this evil time, O oh God. We pray for the children as they um, go to school. We remember Lauren as she completes her final year in high school, O oh God. That you'd cause her to perform well so that she would be a good testimony even through her performance. We pray for Scotty. Help him, O oh God. We know the distractions that he would receive as a young man. And he is not exempt because he is the pastor's son. But preserve him and keep him, O oh God. Keep him pure in his mind, in his thoughts, in his motives. And then we pray for the children, for little Logan and Leah. Keep them protected, O oh God, from all harm and danger. Keep their minds pure. And we cannot forget Sister Janelle, who is perhaps the glue in the family in terms of keeping things in order. We pray, God, that you would give her the mental capacity to deal with the day-to-day -day, um, operation of home, being a wife and a mother and bus driver taking the children up and down. Keep her safe, O oh God, as she moves about. We pray for the home, that you would keep it safe, that all the provisions will be met, all of the needs will be accounted for. Oh God, we pray for good health. We pray for sound mind. We pray, God, that your angels will be around them, their vehicles and their home. And when the evil one tries to get close, when he sees the numbers that are around them, protecting them, he will flee. He will run. Chase him away, O oh God. Father, we pray for the life of the church as a result of Pastor Lyle's ministry of leadership that the church will be healthy because of his leadership, that the church will grow because of his leadership. God, that because of his leadership, that we will see you lifted up in our nation, and that those who do not know you, or those who are confused, will be set right. Continue to be with this family, O oh God. Continue to meet their needs. Bless them. Keep them. In Jesus' name we commit them. Amen. 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 Amen.
Amen, Grace. At this time, we're going to ask the Sunday school directors to come forward, Sunday school teachers to come forward, and we're going to dismiss the kids for Sunday school. Pastor Lyle Bethel, Senior Pastor of Grace Community Church, the man of God that will bring the word of God for you today. Pastor Lyle. Before I get to my message, I was quite shocked to hear the name Angela Palacios called in our service, for it is rare, I would say, not possible to hear another pastor's name called in another church. And so I looked around and figured, well, is this another Angela Palacios? To my knowledge, there was only one name. And as I looked, I saw it was the Reverend Angela Palacios. And Grace, I want us to give her a very special welcome. Uh, Reverend Palacios, please stand. A, a woman I highly respect and one who is highly respected in this country. She's a powerful preacher, clear, clear in her thinking, always has something to say. Reverend Palacios, it's a delight to have you in our congregation today. I, 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 knowing that you and Camille have a good relationship, I said, was there a, a, a special reason that brought you? And it turns out you're just visiting with us. And uh, please take a few moments to be with us upstairs. We'd, we'd love to be able to have a few minutes fellowshipping with you uh, around a, a uh, what is he, he says party, but it's more uh, refreshments. <laughs> oh, well, Grace, it is a delight to be back home with you. Um, uh, I missed you sorely. It was good to be off with the family, but uh, to be away from the Bahamas during Christmas is... Ah, wow. When, everybody's, when everybody is home and you're not there. You know me, Mr. Socialite, that was quite hard on me. Uh, I was able to follow occasionally um, by means of our, thank God for technology, by means of Grace's uh, blog, not blog, um, uh, internet uh, streaming, I was able to catch some of it. Uh, I got some wonderful responses to the video that I left. And I uh, got some, uh, really some powerful comments from you. A, a number of you expressed how delighted you were to uh, still hear the pastor, though he was not present. And uh, I, I was grateful to hear that. We live in a technological age, and distance ought not to keep the word contained when we have the benefit of technology. Our message today is titled God's Timing and My Time. It, it's not a message new to me. There are a number of authors. Uh, when you've been preaching as long as I have, you realize that 
you're not really saying anything new. The Spirit may give you some new inspiration, a new, new uh, handle on it, but by and large, 2,000 years of preaching, persons have said what you've said before. And um, uh, so I want to begin our time together with asking God to further help us as we would shift our worship from participation to listening with an attitude to learn and apply, shall we? Father, we pause to acknowledge again your greatness, your glory, and that you sent your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died for us that we might live to the praise of your glory. Help us now as we, in these moments that remain, hear from you through your servant. I pray, Lord, that I would be clear that the people of God would gain a new sense of the time that they have, the season that they're in, to do what you call them to do. To this end, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ, asking that your spirit would be present to instruct and help us and would later bring to mind the things that we have been taught. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I had a powerful week with the ministry of Josh McDowell Ministries. I was privileged to be personally invited to be one of those specially selected to have a man who has been in ministry for 52 years, an apologetics expert. In fact, I think regardless of one's denomination, he is considered this generation's best apologist, able to defend the faith. He has taken it around the world. He's been on every continent. He's shared perhaps with more students and persons than anyone else on planet Earth. And he has done an excellent job of defending the faith uh, before Muslims, communists, Maoists, you name it. And he is responsible for many millions coming to the faith. And he asked certain persons that he saw God doing things with, please, I would like to pour my life into a select few, and I was grateful to be chosen to be one of those, and I'm grateful for that time of further training. Ecclesiastes, from which we will read a portion today, I just want to start with the first verse, for it, it frames our message today. And my apologies, I did not have time to get the handouts prepared. You'll imagine a busy week from 8 in the morning to sometimes 9 in the evening. You don't have any lag time uh, to, to work on things. And so I, I was able to get the message, but not my handouts. It says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time for everything, Ecclesiastes 3.1, a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A panel from the famous comic strip, The Family Circus, has Dolly, one of the children, shown drawing a picture with her crayons. Her grandmother passes by and asks her, Honey, what are you drawing? To which the little girl answers, I don't know. I'll decide after I'm finished. It's, it's, a humorous, it's a humorous response from an artistic child, but a tragic and oft-repeated reality for many teenagers and adults. If we wait to decide on the direction of our life until we've finished, there's a very high probability it won't be the destination we wanted. Clear vision for where we hope to end up helps us make better decisions in the present and offers a much more redemptive journey. That's my intro. And before I would proceed further, I uh, was asked to let the church know, as you know, you had an opportunity to pray for Sister Ramona, who is presently off in the States. She had her first surgery on her eyes, cataract surgery, and all... The reports say that the first surgery has gone extremely well and, and um, she is doing fine. That's the report we've received from Brother Cyril through his daughter, Megan. And um, so we are, we are grateful 
for that news and continue to pray for her that the other eye would, the surgery would, would be just as uh, impactful. And uh, once again, congratulations to all of the, uh, the newly engaged. We'll get to that perhaps on Wednesday. No time for that now. But it seems indeed that there's something in the water. And I encourage, I encourage those of you who uh, don't want to move that way, watch what you drink. I spoke to one of the young men. He says he won't bathe in that water. He's ready to be married. So... Um, if, I won't tell you who that is, but uh, if you are available, I'll have a look at you, and uh, I'll, I'll determine, based on your spirituality, whether I should forward your name to his address. <laughs> Amen. You know, as I said during the communion moments, I love celebrating the, the new year to, to be a part of a new season, a new, new change. The, it's an opportunity to have a fresh start, a clean slate, to just start all over again. And I, 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 I think that, that we all recognize how important these moments are. For many persons, it's a time for personal evaluation. And I want to encourage you to continue to be about the business, asking God's Spirit to help you, to search you, to, as you evaluate your life physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Today, I want to talk about your spiritual health, as you would expect. And if you haven't already done so, I want to encourage you to spend time during the message as I am speaking to ask God to speak to you, to search you, to give you wisdom and insight on the things that will be shared. But how is your spiritual walk, believer? I encourage you during the communion moments, reminded you that there are things you need to cast off and certainly things you need to put on. But do you have a personal relationship with the one who made you, who died for you? Are you as close to God as you want to be? The start of a new year is a great time to begin that. In fact, in so many ways, the need for change is evident in life. I'm not sure if you know it, but some time ago, a laboratory, white laboratory, discovered that 68% of the cells that are in your body today were not there 365 days before. Your whole body has undergone a cellular change. Your entire body. You're not the same person, literally, that you were last year at this time. Of course, it goes a lot deeper than that, just physically. A lot of things can happen in a year, can't they? We've had new births. We've had deaths of beloved family members. We have had persons switching jobs, persons have lost jobs, some have lost hair, and some have had to say hello to new wrinkles, but there have been changes. Some of you have started attending church here over the past year, and we thank God for you and pray that you would indeed find your home here among us, and you would enjoy growing in your relationship with God with us together. So a lot happens in a new year. We tend to do two things in January, to look back with regret, wishing that we had done something differently, and we look to the new year and begin it with lots of resolves about what we would do. Now, last Sunday, I asked you to commit yourself to some things that would help you as you began the new year. And um, given the, the moments to remember the scriptures earlier, I'm not sure many of you will remember what they were. So... For your recollection, I'll say them again. I encourage you to commit yourself to forget your failures, based on Philippians 3.13, which says, Forgetting what is behind and straining or reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on. I press on towards the goal for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So commit to forget your failures, for they can hold you back. I encourage you, too, to commit yourself to give up your grudges. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with one another. Bear with each other in love and forgive each other whatever grievances you may have against one another. Now, what's interesting here is he's talking to the church. Yes, friends. Paul acknowledges that there are grievances and hurts and pains and grudges in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He acknowledges that. He knows it. And he says, but listen, bear with one another. Don't just bear grudgingly. Bear with one another in love, forgiving each other, whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. 
the very one who demonstrates his love towards us in this, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. That's the standard, that's the template, that's the model. So friends, the giving up of grievances and grudges can, ought to, and must happen because Christ is the standard. So no one could say, I can't. I can't is only I won't, and I choose to be disobedient. That's all I can't means when it comes to God giving the saints of God a clear directive. I can't is not applicable. doesn't work. Drop it from your vocabulary. You must. You represent Christ. Brother Derwin, good to see you. Good to see you, Derwin Johnson. Praise the Lord. The third thing was, commit to restoring your relationships. Bible says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. The fourth thing I brought to your attention was this. Commit yourself to turn your back on your transgressions. I based that on Romans 6, 2. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to its lustful desires. We are no longer slaves to sin. In my time today, I want to uh, use that as a, a, a launch pad to get into an appreciation that we have a time in which to do these things. God, by means of his word, helps us to understand that he has set time and place for us. Our lives are to be lives of purpose. And beyond that, we must do everything in season. For seasons come and go. But let me not get ahead of myself. The scriptures, turn your Bibles, if you're not already there, Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8. The preacher, the writer of Ecclesiastes says, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Hmm. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. From this passage, I want to lift three words for you. Three words and focus on them for the duration of our message. The first one, time. The second, purpose. And the third, season. I will make sure that you have the notes handy during our Wednesday evening. We'll get into this uh, as well. But So for now, just go ahead and listen, and you can circle or underline in your Bibles as you follow along. The first one, time. Let's look at that. In Genesis chapter 1, 3 through 5, the scriptures say, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. And he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. We see from this passage that time was created for us. Time was created for us. You see, God is creating time. He exists outside of time, but he's creating time for us. He creates time for us to achieve in time the purposes and plans that, as we saw in our scripture memory, things that he had prepared in advance for us to do. This passage helps us to understand that God has created time for us to achieve things within that time. But we also see that God is not bound by time. Friends, God's timing is sovereign as well. And I want to give an illustration that will help us to understand as we go about serving God in time, that we can trust our sovereign God, who is God of time, that our lives are ordered by him. Now, I've given this illustration before, but it fits well with the point I want to make. In the book, The Hiding Place, Corrie ten Boom tells of a night when German and English planes were dogfighting. There were just all of these... Uh, the planes are swooping and fighting and shooting um, their, their, their guns at each other. And um, as she laid in her bed listening to 
all the noise in the uh, skies above her in Holland, she was terrified. But she heard her sister Betsy stirring in the kitchen, and she raced downstairs just to be with another person. For an hour, they sipped tea together until the sky was silent. Corey returned to her bed in a darkened room. She ran a hand over the pillow and felt a piece of metal. There was a 10-inch piece of metal that had fallen into her bed. She rushed to tell Betsy, Betsy, if I hadn't heard you in the kitchen. But Betsy put her finger on her mouth. Don't say it, Corey. There are no ifs in God's world, and no places that are safer than other places. The center of his will is our only safety. Oh, Corey, let us pray that we may always know it. We may always know the safety of living in his perfect will, because we're living lives obedient to him. Do you know that kind of peace in your life, beloved? Let me ask you something. In your life, have you ever found yourself wondering, like Corey did, what if, what if? Sometimes we wonder why God doesn't answer our prayers when we ask him. How many of you have ever prayed for something and your prayer went unanswered? Boy, you are lying in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe every hand in here ought to go up. The question was, how many of you have ever prayed for something and your prayer went unanswered? Your prayer went unanswered. Or wasn't answered the way you wanted it to be answered? I believe that's all of us. And we start to wonder about God's timing in our lives. We start to ask questions like, why didn't God answer my prayer? Do I not have enough faith? How often do we, do we run to that default question? Do I not have enough faith? Doesn't God care about my problems and how I'm feeling? We've all asked these questions during the dark moments of our lives. So what are the answers? I certainly wish I could answer all those tough questions for you today, but I can't. But here's what the Bible can answer for us. God's timing is sovereign. God's timing is sovereign. God's timing is sovereign. And that must suffice. The timing of God is sovereign. That means he is in total control. If you'll notice the first part of Ecclesiastes 3.1, the writer says, there is an appointed time for everything. Not most things. Not convenient things. Not happy things only. Not even only positive things. There's a time for everything. An appointed time for everything. There's an appointed time in God's table, timetable for everything. And if you can learn to live with that in mind, it'll make those unanswered prayers a whole lot easier to live with. And it'll make those dark places in your life a little less dark. The second, the second thing we want to pull out of our, out of our scriptures for today, and that is this business of purpose. Lives lived with purpose, a sense of being in the will of God. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, and God is speaking, and it's interesting, the, this Jeremiah passage comes in the midst of much uh, common, uh, condemnation and lamentation of the people of God who are struggling under the, the judgment of God. And in the midst of all of these pronouncements of judgments, he says this, for I know, for I know, Friends, you don't, you, you ain't going to know. You may know partially, but listen, it doesn't matter what you know. I know, says the Lord. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Friends, as I said to you, faith is trusting in the integrity and character of God, period, full stop. That's what faith is. And faith hears this passage, God saying to that distraught soul, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. There are plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. For I know. Friends, you can't know. You are a creature locked in time. You live minute by minute, hour by hour. You can't know. But God outside of time? God says, I know. And God, because he's sovereign, he can bring it about. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And they are plans to prosper you. No matter how it looks. No matter how it feels. Because God is sovereign and because he's loving and because he loves you. God wants your heart to know 
for I know the plans I have for you. Don't just be satisfied in my sovereignly knowing. Be satisfied in the beneficial nature, the benevolent nature I have towards you. They are plans to prosper you and not harm you. No wonder Paul can say in the powerful passage in Romans, for we know that all things work out, work together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Paul knows Jeremiah 29, 11. Paul knows he can relax in confidence because a sovereign loving God says he knows the plans he has for him. And if you think if you think that passage helps you, let me give you another. Jeremiah chapter 1, 5 through 8. God says to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, you don't even exist yet. In time, you don't exist. But me, outside of time, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Do you hear God's purpose for Jeremiah? Before the man is born, before his parents have come together, God knows him, has a plan for his life, and that will be lived out in time. Got it? But listen to Jeremiah. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said... I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. Now, mind you, he's, what he means is in, 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 the, in the scope of things, he's like a child compared to all of these big bad wolves of uh, uh, Jerusalem who would tear a young novice like him apart. He says, God, I could barely speak. I'm like a child in the scheme of all these things. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you. And I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Woo! You hear the purpose? You hear the purpose? When you live out God's purpose in time, God protects you. Do what God says. Let him deal with the results. You go. I will rescue you. No one will stand before you. Because I have an eternal purpose. Before you were even conceived. I'll tell you one thing. Some of you have always lamented how you came into this earth. You were born out of wedlock. Maybe you're the product of a rape. Who knows? Who knows? Let me say, who cares? Because regardless, God knew you before you were born. And God has a purpose for you. Don't be confused with the circumstances of your DNA. God says, I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you that must be lived out in time. Oh, friends, don't get confused. Don't get confused with how your DNA got put in you, please. Don't get mixed up about who your family is. God has a plan for you. Oh, won't you find his good, perfect plan for you? Won't you abandon yourself to God's will and say, Do with me as you must, as you ought, as you will. For as John Wesley Long recognized, there's no safer place to be than in the center of God's will. No safer place to be. These two scriptures establish a point that I want to bring out. Before we were born, God knew us and had a purpose for us. But further to this, we can understand that he expects us to fulfill his purposes for us in the time that we have. Our third point. Everything has a season. God's timing is seasonal. His timing is seasonal. Let's look at it again with some new eyes. As we saw, a time to be born, a time to die. A time to plan, a time to approve, a time to kill, a time to heal. He has these couplets going on. Just, just 
straight throughout all the various scenes of life. What do you think the point of this section of Scripture really is? Is it really about killing and healing and mourning and dancing? What is the principle of timing here that God is bringing forward out of this? What can we uncover that God may be trying to communicate to us? Notice something very important in these verses. Birth and death, killing and healing, tearing down and building up, weeping and laughing. There's a pattern. All of these seasons that the Bible describes are opposites, and they're seasonal. They're seasonal. They're seasonal. This isn't just talking about picking up stones and throwing them back. This passage is describing all the different seasons of life. Life comes at us in seasons. It's not just one big, long, monotonous grind of life. But I will say this. To the person who doesn't recognize seasons and who does not believe that God is good, it is one monotonous, long grind of life. Can I get some kind of a witness out there? You see, to the person stubbornly resisting the will of God, to the person who doesn't trust God, it seems like one long grind to your life. But life is seasonal. All of nature, you see it. Things go through their seasons. Summer, spring, winter, fall. Nobody gets a harvest in winter. That's not the season for it. There are seasons of vigor, there are seasons of rest, there are seasons of loss, and there are seasons of refreshing and renewal. The key to really living a full life is to catch on to what God is doing in your life during each season. I'll say it again. The key to really living your life to the fullness of God is to figure out what God is doing in each season and cooperate with Him and go along with Him in His plans. In other words, I think what God would say to us in Ecclesiastes is that there's only a period of time or season of time in which I'm going to be doing this in your life. And then I'm moving on to something else in your life. Take advantage of the season you're in. That's why it's so important for us to know God's timing so that we can begin to learn how to live in the ebb and flow of life. Brothers and sisters, if we're not willing to change during those times when God has come to us and he is calling us to change, he's calling us to change and cooperate with him, friends, you're going to get left behind. He'll move on again for a season of time and, and may return again to try to move you into his purpose. Friends, distrust of God is an awful thing. For you will miss what he has for you in a season. You'll miss your purpose. You'll miss true joy in life. There's a specific purpose for each season. In fact, Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. They're, they're controlled. He, he moves in them. How do we apply these things to our life? Psalm 20 verse 4 says, May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. That's a good prayer to pray for someone, particularly after we pray that they would remain in the center of God's will. What are your purposes? What are your desires? God who is outside of time sees all of my life at one time. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Did you hear that? Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Nothing. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Brothers and sisters, live your lives in holy fear as those who must give an accounting to God for the time that you've spent. Have you, have you realized God's purpose for your life? Are you trying to live that out? 
Are you using the time that God has given you wisely? Brothers and sisters, God has seen the past years clearly, and he sees the coming years for you just as clearly. The past is as clear to him as is the future, as is the present. You only have the present before you. Even your backward glance of the past is not a perfect view. That's been, that's been obscured by your perceptions and biases, and you can't see what God was actually doing in your past. I like to see it this way. Imagine someone standing on a tall building, and they're watching a half-mile parade. They can literally see the parade from start to stop at one glance. At one glance. They know everything that's happening. Now, mind you, the guy at the back of the line has no idea how many corners they uh, juke and juke through and what's coming up where, and so they can't see it. But the guy on top of the roof can. And he's able to cooperate with marshals along the parade by means of a walkie-talkie and tell them X, Y, Z. Pick up the pace. We're lagging behind. Gaps are being created. He's able to do that. God, however, is able to be present throughout our lives, for he exists outside of time, and he sees it all at a glance, and he knows how to bring about his purposes in us if we would submit to his good will concerning us. Now, as we saw in the devotional during the communion moments, he's already demonstrated his love. Oh, friend, if we'd only trust this God who has already demonstrated his love. Trust your life into his hands. He's got good plans for you. Now, not problem-free plans. Please don't hear good as problem-free. That ain't so. Everyone who in good shape know it took hours of, of um, disciplined time in the weight room or jogging or running or swimming to get in optimum shape. Hours, days, weeks, months. Supplements for the body. Now, I say steroids. I say supplements. All right? And it was discipline. It was pain. So please, God's good will for your life does not mean it is pain-free. For we grow in pain. The scriptures we read earlier, perseverance, building character, and so forth. Yes, God sees it all at a glance, but there's something wonderful I haven't yet brought out. That Hebrews passage continues in 14 and 16 of Hebrews. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, <coughs> let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. For we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. End quote. Stop for a second. You know what the Hebrew writer is saying. He's saying, don't hesitate to approach God. For he already knows what the coming year holds, and he already has gone through the trials and problems that we could go through. So let's come to him and receive the strengthening that only he can give, the encouragement as to what's to take place. He knows what's coming, but he can be approached as a friend who can help us for what is to come in the coming year. Many of you, as we've said, have lost loved ones. Many of you have lost jobs. And you may think, oh, it's all over. No, 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 it's seasonal. No, it's seasonal. Let me correct you. Um, one of the brothers in the church used to say, I'm not sure if his theological rendering of it is correct, but there's a principle behind it that's true. And it came to pass. Okay? The situation came on you only to pass by you. Of course, that's not quite what the scripture is saying, but it's a good thing to keep in your head. It will pass. This too will pass. Let me learn in the season that I have. You see, friends, because... The farmer who doesn't plant when there's a season to plant is not going to get anything for doing work in that season when the next season rolls around where harvest is supposed to come. You got it? So what we do in one season affects what happens in another season. Anyone out there listening to me? So we must maximize the seasons that we find ourselves in, and we can best maximize them by drawing close to the Lord and saying, Lord, here I am. I want to 
fulfill your will. I, I want to be available for all that you have for me to do. Here's my life. Use it to the praise of your glory. There may be times when you don't feel like you have a real friend in the whole world, but you have this friend who sticks closer than a brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. Another way and another part of, uh, uh, of what can be said about this verse is it says, in our time of need. God's help is always just in the nick of time. Those who have been following the Lord for a while can testify to what I'm saying. How many times in your life have you been faced with a seemingly impossible situation and God interve intervened in just the nick of time? If you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, just talk to one of your friends about the sufficiency of God's timing and you will learn that he can be trusted whatever be tied. One final thought. God's timing in the midst of all that we're talking about is surprising. We're not always ready for it. We can usually think of a thousand reasons why we're not ready to do what God wants us to do. But when we look at these scriptures, some thoughts jump off the page. And who am I that I should ever know his ways? His ways are higher than my ways, and his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And about the time I think I have God figured out, he just slips by me again. I realize he is past understanding. He takes me to another season. He surprises me with another of his various ways of working through people. You know, we may be on the side here praying for money because we need to do this, and God slips in, slip that in by giving us the gift of a home. You, you got it? I mean, you can't pin God down to your prayer. What you can do is trust him. That's what you can do. You, you can't pigeonhole him as to how he's going to respond. But one thing you can do is trust him. Because he proves himself over and over again. Friends, to maximize my potential in the coming year, there are two things I must do. I must study the movements of God's timings in my life, and I must seize the moment of his timing. And there's no way to do these things, friends, other than to be in a personal, daily relationship with the Lord. Where you're talking to him, and he's talking to you. That relationship is a sound one, and God is able to prepare you for what is coming. God is able to sow the seeds in the right season because you've been obedient, so that when harvest comes, you have all that you need for whatever trial or blessing that comes your way. So what are some things you can do? I want to encourage you this year, don't get so preoccupied with the TV shows and, and other things that takes your time away from God. If you're going to be in the car for two hours, hey, listen, get the Bible on CD and listen to that. Or make sure you know uh, how you can listen to the Tony Evans and other good speakers out there. Maybe you can um, make sure you have access to the, the uh, CDs that are available by the church. You can listen to the sermons again and, and, and digest them. Uh, we want to make sure that our library is up to snuff where you can even listen to some old messages. Uh, Pastor Rex and, and others who have um, had that timeless word immortalized at present on tape. But we want to make sure we can have those available to you at a, at a later time on uh, CDs that you can listen to them in your cars. But what can you do as I close my message? You can spend time with God and expect him to speak to you. Now, there's no other better way to do this than to have a journal. You've been hearing me say this for low 20 years. And at this, um, at the seminar that I was at, every so often it would slip in somebody's conversation. You know, as I was journaling the other day and I just smiled at myself, I said, now this person is staying current with God. There's value to journaling. You get to, you, 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 you hear what God is saying. You, it's written there for posterity. You, 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 you know the kinds of prayers you're praying and how God has answered. And so you need to expect God to speak to you as you draw close to him. Perhaps you need to vary the, time, vary the pattern of your time with God. Some people uh, get stuck in, well, you know, my quiet time is I sit down, I open my daily bread, I read for 15 minutes, and I close in prayer. Friends, I'm sorry. That don't do nothing for me. That don't do nothing for me. I, I got to get in the car and drive and pray. I got to go on the beach and walk the beach and hear the waves rolling. I got to walk through a wooded area. And friends, I need to be moving. Those that visit this church from time to time will see me walking the campus, walking and praying. I just, I, I'm, I'm not a, I, I need to, I need to be moving. I need to, I, God, God, I can hear him when I'm moving, when I'm doing things. And, and many of you are like that. Please, 
if you're in a rut, change what you're doing. Perhaps it's time to change to get a new Bible. And uh, maybe you've been stuck with a Bible. It seems like you're not quite uh, getting much. We'll just switch to another version. Perhaps you might want to get a paraphrase, the message version. Or, or maybe they, they have the Bible on CD now, um, the Bible experience that you can purchase. A little pricey, but you can slip that in your car and listen to that. You can put it on your iPod, your various electronic devices, and just, just listen. Spend some time in the Word of God. Um, <clears throat> And you want to open your heart to God's teaching. Make yourself available to the Sunday school program. Make yourself available to all of the opportunities for service and growth. These, this is your season to grow and learn. Use it wisely. Test all of your feelings with God's word. Sometimes we get impressions. You need to check that with the word of God. I was one of the senior persons at the conference. And every so often I'd be talking with one of the younger men. And, and I was just able to put that many years of pastoral ministry to good use, and I was profusely thanked for it because they were about to make a silly decision. And, um, you know, there's, there's value in an abundance of godly counselors to speak into your life. Don't just get a thought in your head and run with that. Check that with godly counsel. Improve your study by taking notes. Friends, the reason I'm a pastor who gives you notes to take, today not being the, the best example of that, is I've learned from taking notes. And I know it will engage your mind more. You ought not to come to Grace Community Church with your hands swinging. You need to come with a Bible in your hand. Never mind that uh, we put the Bible up. You need to have your Bible in your hand. You need to always have a pen in your Bible. And you need to come prepared to learn, to write in those notes and ask God, God, I want to learn a little bit more what the pastor's saying. Uh, give us some time in the days to come to get into this a little bit more. Stop being lazy about your Christian faith. Stop being lazy. I can't spoon feed you. Um, there's only a certain time that you're expected to be taking milk. You need to know how to self-feed. Comes a time when even the best wife will say, go in the kitchen and make that yourself. You need to learn how to grow yourself. Get into the Word of God yourself. Notice opportunities to apply what it is you've learned and share what you're learning with other people. I love to hear my members call me and say, boy, Pastor Lyle, I shared your message, word, almost word for word, with some of my coworkers. And then there was a people on the road, I shared it with them too, and my neighbors, oh, I'm in my glory. I I'm like a dog laying down to get the stomach scratch. I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. You mean the word went beyond the pulpit? Praise you, Lord. Because that's what we ought to be doing. That's what we ought to be doing. Please, let me hear more stories. I love to hear that. Not for no glory of my part, but it, what it means is the word has been transferred. And not just you've heard it, you're passing it on. And as you pass it on, you absorb it. So how can, how can you, what am I saying here? How can you make, take full advantage of this coming year? Remember everything we've talked about. You're in some season of life right now. I don't know what it is. Perhaps you don't know what it is, but I'll tell you one thing's necessary in every season you're in. Learn. Grow. Draw near to God. Let God speak to you. Journal so you know what's going on. Do you know I can pull out my journal 31 years ago and be right back where I was there? learning the lessons God had me. And then when I do a scan, I see the lessons he's taught me again and again and again and again. You can't do that because your memory ain't that good. Neither is mine. But I journal and you don't. And I'm growing. You're not. Now, why am I saying it that way? Try to provoke you. Try to provoke you. Some of you do journal. I know it. But I want you to understand that this brain of yours does not remember details. It doesn't remember things. You're going to forget most, if not all, of what I say by 4 o'clock today. Only unless I do something magnanimous. You saw when Pastor Lyle did a backflip, boy. And, and that's, that's the only way you can remember. No, friends, you can't trust your memory. And so, we must be ready. Be ready. That's what I want to tell you this morning. Be ready. Be ready for the season that you're in. Be ready for your purpose. And grow in your relationship with God that you will be prepared for all that is coming. For I don't know what this year has in store for you, but I can tell you, you can be prepared for it if you will be ready. If you will be determined to grow in your relationship. If you'll recognize that seasons come and go. But a good God, 
God, whose character you can trust, has got it all in his hands. And he says, trust me for your life. I have a purpose that I am establishing and bringing about. This is a season you're in. It will come to pass. And so you can trust me. I want to end our time together with prayer for you. I've been prayed for. I want to pray for you. I don't know if I will have to console you or if perhaps you will have to be consoling me and my family. We don't know what the year has in store. We don't know what the future has for us, but we have a relationship with the God of our future. And it's his hands we need to hold. And so I would like for you, if I can't force it on you, but I would like for you with a willing heart, if you want to say to God today, God, I want you in my life. I want your purpose to be established and realized in my life. I want to know, Lord, I'm living my life with purpose and I'm taking advantage of every season I'm in. If that's your heart's desire, I'd like for you to stand because I'd like to pray for you. I'd like for us to indeed realize the full potency of his power in our lives because we made ourselves available and ready. The musicians are just going to play one verse of... Uh, this short hymn in his time and then I'm going to return and ask the Lord's function blessing over our lives. Amen. the sovereign Lord of the universe who has good plans for you, who demonstrated how much you could trust him and that he sent Christ to die for you while you were yet in your sins. Do you trust him? Do you trust him with your life? Do you trust him for what this year has in store for you? Do you trust him? Even though you don't know what the, the, the year has in store for you, do you trust him? Will you commit all that you are to serving him regardless? He can be trusted. He's a good God. And he says, I know the plans I have for you. And check it out. He has plans. Oh, but you say, Pastor Lyle, I I'm insignificant. I I'm, all, I'm only a housewife. Or, uh, Pastor Lyle, you don't know. I I've had a messed up life. I, I was abused as a child. And, and, and you just don't know. Friends, listen to me. That is a devilish lie. And God rebukes you in the same spirit with which he rebuked Jeremiah. Do not say to me, I am a child. Do not say to me, I was abused. Don't say to me, I have nothing to offer. The most powerful moment in our seminar that I just went, went through, Josh McDowell sodomized as a little boy from 6 to 13. Did you hear me? Sat in a meeting where he heard the great chaplain Haverstone ask them, give all of your gifts and talents to the Lord and he can use them. He said, Lord, I have nothing to offer, nothing. And he ran out of there ashamed. God met him that day. And as a result of Josh McDowell saying to God, well, God, I give you the nothing that I am. Use even that if you can. Because of that, Josh McDowell is the most renowned, most powerful apologetics uh, teacher on planet Earth. 52 years he's given himself to the advance of the gospel, to the proclamation of it, to making the faith clear to all. He has defended the faith for 52 years. A man who had nothing to give to God. And God gave him everything. God says in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. So I want to encourage you, if you have nothing to give to God, give him your nothing and say, God, use the little I have 
and make an abundant harvest of that. Is there anyone here who has that attitude and disposition towards this sovereign God? Lord, take even what I don't have to give and use it for your glory. Shall we pray? Oh, Father, how we thank you that you have made seasons. You've made seasons that help us to understand we've come out of one uh, uh, area perhaps of pain, turmoil, strife, or even bounty. And we're moving into another season. But Lord, just as we could trust you in the good, we can, can, we can trust you in the calamity. Just as you were with us in the calamity, you are with us in the good times. And so Lord, we have heard today that we ought to trust you in all things. We've heard today that we must trust you because you have a plan for us, a purpose for us. You can make what is broken and ruined in our lives new. You can transform us. And so, Lord, we offer ourselves today, man, woman, teenager, boy, girl, we give ourselves to you. We, we say, Lord, here I am, as Isaiah said, here I am, use me. Here I am, Lord, take that which I don't even think I have. I give it to you. I ask that you would use it. Lord, I give you my future. I give you this year. I ask that you would walk with me through it. By your Holy Spirit, draw me into a closer relationship with yourself. And may your Holy Spirit fill me with all the power that is needed to live a godly life. I bend my knee and my heart to you and pray that you would use me to the praise of your glory. Fill us now by your Holy Spirit. Teach us to serve you in the beauty of holiness. And may we together raise the water table of righteousness and holiness. May we together as a church show forth the excellencies of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen and amen. To you turn your neighbor and say, I'm going to live this year to the praise of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our service is over, but your service to the Lord remains. Go and serve the Lord. Amen and amen. Someone has lost some keys. If you don't know where your keys are with uh, your car keys, you don't know where that is, please see me. And with a proper description, we'll make sure that you receive your car keys. Thank you. We want to invite our guests to join us upstairs for moments of light refreshments. Thank you.
Father, to go and get us. That's what you would have to do.